All right, we're going to be in Acts 17. One thing I noticed about what's going on here is when Paul and Silas, since they started this journey together into Europe, through Greece, beginning in Greece, it's uh, it's getting increasingly violent everywhere they go. So uh, Christianity has started getting dangerous for these guys. You know, they're taking their life into their hands everywhere they go. You remember, he's already been stoned to the point of death, you know, and, and everybody thought he was dead and he got up and walked back into the city. So, as they go into Thessalonica here, we've got several things that we're going to look at. Thessalonica is a place in Greece. Uh, now, when they had passed through Am Amph Amphipolis or Amph Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and spent three Sabbath days. Uh, and on three Sabbath days, he, he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead. This, and saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. So he was going to the Jews in the synagogues, as was his custom. That's the first thing he did in these cities. He went to the Jews. And uh, he was preaching. I like the way they, uh, Luke puts this right here. He says, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead. You know, all these, all these Jews in particular... They were just totally stuck on the idea that the Messiah was going to come back and destroy the Romans and put the Jews over the entire world, basically. And uh, that's what they lived for. That's what they focused on. And the idea of the Christ or the Messiah coming to the earth and having to, well, as it said, to suffer and to rise from the dead, that was so foreign to their thinking because they never heard anyone talk about in such a way and it was hard for him to take but it says then some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women but the Jews were jealous and taking some wicked men of the rabble and let me just say about wicked men of the rabble they're everywhere all the time. They can always be found. Always. We got wicked men of the rabble right here in America. You know, they're a dime a dozen, but they can cause a lot of trouble. Uh, we've seen it all over our cities, uh, especially in 2020. But it says, but the Jews were jealous and taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. They were living in the house of Jason. Now, who was this Jason? It doesn't say a whole bunch about him. But I'll tell you this, Jason is not a Jewish name. It's a Gentile name. So he was staying, Paul was staying in the house of a Gentile. A self-respecting Jew would never name anybody in his family a name like this, you know, Jason. So... So that's how we know. So they were staying with him, and they go to his house, and they drag Jason out of the house and some of the other brothers before the city authorities. And this is what they had to say about the people, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. Amen. Lord, for that to be said about us. Amen. You know, they, they meant it as a slur. Amen. But just to know... Uh, even just right here in our community that we've made such a, a big deal in our community that people would say because of Lake Seminole Baptist Church, our whole community's turned around. You know, that that could be done. Amen. That could happen. Yes, sir. That could happen. Or do we want it? Yeah. That's, the, that's the main thing. Is that what we want them to say about us? 
because they're not gonna they're not gonna try to stone us or or hurt us or accuse us or anything like that. In this case, uh, we want them to. Well, I would hope they wouldn't. But uh, you know, for people to say they've made a big difference in the community, that's a big deal. So these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. These guys were saying this in the in the form of a, they've upset the apple cart everywhere they've been, and now they want to do it here too. People don't like the apple cart being upset. They sure don't. And they went on to say, and Jason has received them. They knew Jason pretty well. I don't know exactly what he was, but, but uh, he was well known apparently. And they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar. Now here come where the lies are. Saying that there is another king, Jesus. You know, they didn't get that part. There is another king, but his kingdom is not of this world. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. So I guess that kind of means, you know, they got bonded out, I reckon. Uh, but uh, I don't think they were going to get that money back. And when they had taken the money and security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. So the brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. They said, y'all have got to go. We love you, but you got to go. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now this, I, I love this part right here. And it's some of my favorite verses right here because it makes it plain on, you know, how the church is supposed to act and what they're supposed to do beyond the preacher that preaches every Sunday, you know. Or beyond all the leaders even. But this is, he says, now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. And I love that right there. What does he mean by noble? They were ready to hear. They were ready to hear. Uh, they received the word with all eagerness. And this is the part I love the most. Examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. So in other words, Paul and Silas were preaching in Berea. And they, they were ready to hear it. They said they had eagerness. Eagerness. But, but they also, they went home and looked up the stuff that Paul and Silas were talking about to make sure it was right. To make sure it was right. Accountability, as Jamie said, exactly. To look at it, you know, uh, I heard somebody, uh, We there was one guy that used to speak, I can't remember who it was, but every now and then he would say something that wasn't right. And he would do it just to check. Do you remember that, Brenda? I can't remember who it was. Just to see if everybody's going to let him off the hook about what he said. You know, if I, if I say something, now probably ain't everybody going to tolerate this, so I just warned you. But if I say something that is patently false about the gospel, I would hope somebody would stand up and say, Brother, that's not right. I think you, you misspoke or, uh, you know, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe you didn't mean to say that or something. I'm, I'm serious. And why? Why not? Because it's that important. It's that important. And uh, I mean, I, I don't want to say anything ever that goes against the gospel, ever. If that means somebody has to call me out for it, then so be it. And, uh, you know, it's not going to damage my pride, I promise you, because I, I want to be right. And it should, man, any, any preacher or anybody, teacher or whatever, they should never be mad about that. They should never get mad about it. They should never get mad about it. So that, that's why I love that right there. They sat down and they wanted to make sure it was right. 
Many of them therefore believed with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica heard that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds, that mob, that uh, the wicked men of the rabble. They came and stirred up trouble. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea. So he, they're having to go from town to town and, and, and leave to get away with their lives. Because these people, they wouldn't have minded killing them, stoning them to death. Uh, those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens. And after receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. So Paul took off. He went to Athens. Athens, back at that time, that was a, a place of much learning. Uh, the, Roman, the Roman society had pretty much... Uh, uh, what's the word? They had built their they had built their side uh, their their society, uh, their beliefs, their religion had come from the Greeks, and Athens was the the home of the Greeks. They had the same gods. They just gave them different names, but they were the same ones. Uh, all kinds of. Uh, like Zeus, for instance, he was the king of the gods. Uh, the Romans named him Jupiter, and I mean there there are a bunch of them. Uh, there were a bunch of them, but they were all the same gods. And anyhow, Paul was wandering around in Athens, watching this Greek society. And, and in a few minutes, we're going to see a scripture that pretty much summed them up there in Athens, but. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, the spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. There were stone and metal idols all over the city of Athens because this is who they worshipped. Uh, thing about uh, the thing about them is, you know, that was uh, they were idol worshippers, and they are also big into philosophy. They discussed all kinds of. Different philosophies, as we'll see, and, and uh, you know they were proud, rather proud of their their mental geniuses. You know Aristotle and uh, all them guys. I'm uh, there was a bunch of guys. You can Aristotle and and what's some of the other ones? You remember Socrates, Plato, all them people. You know they came from Greece and Athens, and you know they're still volumes of books and libraries, most of them dusty, but libraries from, from these guys from ancient times. In fact, uh, Athens was the famous Greek goddess of Athena. Athena. She was, goddess of she was a god of, uh, goddess of wisdom, and I think I think the Romans wound up calling her Minerva, if I ain't mistaken. But, uh, I could be mistaken. But, but anyhow, while Paul, Paul was waiting for us, so he reasoned in the synagogue, with the Jews and the devout persons and in a marketplace every day with those who happen to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, philosophers also conferred with him. You know who the Epicureans were? They, think the, they thought the meaning of his life just to satisfy all your physical needs all the time. You know? And they, they are a philosophy of indulgence, basically. You know, sort of like we are today. You know, it's it's what you see in the media constantly. You know, you say they're Epicureans. Their their uh, uh, passion is life was to is to satisfy all their indulgences. And uh, you know, I I really think there's some some uh, links to the way we are today. Everything in media, all the commercials, all of our all of our all the stars, I guess you might say, and all entertainers. You look at them, and it's been that way for a, a long time. Everything's about indulging yourself. That's what basically Epicureans were. They looked at it as a philosophy. Why not? Live your life. 
get the it's like a, a, a old Falstaff commercial I remember you know there's, uh, there's all, you only go so far in life or whatever it is or so you better grab all the gusto you can get you know so it's amazing what kids remember I remember that Falstaff commercial which is a brand of beer, if you don't remember. But, uh, uh, let's see. And then the Stoics. They were, they were the direct opposite. The Stoic philosophers, they believed that whatever happened to you, you just took it. You didn't get upset about it. You didn't, you don't jump for joy or nothing like that. You just stay on an even keel, basically, all the time, no matter what. And that's how you'll find satisfaction in life, through the good and the bad. So these were all together, and, and they conversed with them. I bet that was an interesting conversation. But some of them said, what does this babbler wish to say? <laughs> so they didn't show no respect at all, you know. What does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus. Do you know where the Areopagus is? You remember ever seeing pictures of Greece with the tall temples in it? It's the high, rocky place in Athens. And everybody used to go up there. Uh, and I'll show you what they said about, about that right in just a second. May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? And... Uh, for you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now, this is what these guys did. It says, Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time on nothing except telling or hearing something new. That's what they were all about up there. Well, the way Luke says this right here. Yeah. The way Luke says this right here, it sounds a little disparaging to me. Because this is all they live for. This is their entertainment. They didn't have TV to go to. They didn't have all this kind of stuff. So they would go hang out on the Areopagus. And uh, it's pretty steep. It was a little walk. So they worked some to do that, I guess. But they would get up there and they would just be talking about their philosophies and, you know, uh, all this and that, all this and that, and just go on and on and on. If y'all uh, if y'all ever remember watching Lonesome Dove, you remember one time they were uh, uh, Gus and a uh, call were in a store in Nebraska, and uh, he had done bought him a suit. Gus had he was all fancied up, or, and uh, call come in and said, "What are you doing with that?" He said, "I thought we'd uh, be like gentlemen and discuss a, some philosophies." <laughs> and call told him, "I don't know a philosophy. I just know we got work to do." But anyhow, sorry I got off on that, but it was just funny to me. So that's what these people did here. So Paul, he come up there, and he was going to try to tell them, you know, something valid, something real, something life-changing. You know, instead of all this just blabbing up there about what they think about life, you know. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I, perserve, per, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. Religious won't save you, folks. For I passed along and observed the objects of your worship. You know, Areopagus had these great temples, the Temple to Zeus. That's the big one, got the most columns, if you ever see that picture. Uh, but there, you know, there were temples to other gods. But he says, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. I, I just think that's the strangest thing right here. They, they didn't want to offend a God they didn't know about. So they put up a, a, a temple to, to him too. To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. We know that, don't we? Uh, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives all mankind life and breath 
and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. Now, I always found that interesting. He knows all of us personally. He knows we have an allotted time on this earth. We've got that allotted time, and that's all we've got on this earth. When you start thinking of it in terms like that, you know, God knows when we're born. He's been knowing, and he knows when we're going to die. He already knows when our time is. He's fully aware. We don't know, but, but he most certainly does. That is the same way with nations. All through, the, all through the centuries and millenniums, there have been nations rise and then nations fall. And... It's going to happen to America one day. I don't. I don't know how. I mean, we may still be a country. May still be here when the rapture comes. That's fine. But it may not be. God knows. God knows the ultimate. The ultimate test isn't on how powerful a nation is. It's on how God's going to allow it to last. Even the Roman Empire that lasted. Who. I don't know, 1,500 years. Lasted a long time. Lasted a long time. But it ain't here no more. I mean, you can find the ruins. You can find plenty of ways it's still around. But it's gone. Uh, uh, and he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined a lot of periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. Ain't that good to know? People search and search and search their whole lives for what they think God may be, and they make up all kinds of fanciful stuff uh, and all that, you know. Uh, even some nations like India, they have over 300 million gods. You know, I don't know how you possibly know all of them, but they made them up as they went along, I guess. Not even realizing he's right there close to us. You don't have to do all that stuff. You don't have to do it. He, yet he is actually not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of our own, your own poets have said, for we are his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked. This is good scripture here too. But now, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it says in some versions, he winked at. You know, he winked at. King James says he winked at it. The times of ignorance, God winked at. But now, now, and that now that he said then has been ever since Jesus rose from the dead. Now, He commands all people everywhere to repent. That's all of us. Everybody. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And all of this he has given assurance to to all by raising him from the dead. That's some eloquence right there of the gospel. Amen. The times of ignorance God overlooked but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Jesus is going to judge the world one day. He's going to judge the world in righteousness. He's going to judge it in righteousness. Nobody that stands before that judgment is going to be able to say, well, God, you were unfair to me. 
It's going to be judgment and righteousness. Remember what Paul said in Romans? They have no excuse. That's the way it's going to be. That's why I believe you need to be out and Amen. sharing your gospel. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Of course. But others said, we will hear you again about this. You know, in other words, uh, uh, we'll go our way right now and we'll discuss it amongst ourselves and have a philosophy come up about it. And, and, uh, and uh, we'll get back with you later. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed. See, that's what matters. Some believe. Not everybody's going to believe. You're going to get disappointed by some people. But some people are going to believe. Among them, whom also were Dionysus the Areopagite. Now, I don't know. I guess he lived up there, Dionysus. I I think he was probably a, a well-known person in the time. Uh, what his whole deal was, I don't know. And a woman named Damaris. See, what I love here is Luke. This ain't fake, people. He's naming them. He's yeah. telling you who these people are. And their names are in the Lamb's Book of Life. Yeah. And they're, they're with Jesus right now yeah. because they believed what Paul was Lord saying. Jesus. And others with them. There, there were others there also. So praise God. Yes. He was, uh, he was preaching in Greece, and and he was right there up on that hill you see in all the pictures of Greece, with the big temple of Zeus up on it. Paul was up there preaching to them people, and people were saved up there. So he get he gets beat, stoned nearly to death in one city. He goes to another. He gets in trouble there. He goes to another. And uh, uh, gets run out of there. And now here he is in the big city of Athens and people are getting saved. He's spreading that word everywhere he goes. And people are getting saved everywhere he goes. Uh, he's being persecuted. And the word's getting around about him. But he's doing the work of the Lord Almighty. And I just pray to God that we'll do the same thing. One way or another, not maybe necessarily the same way he does, but in some way or another to make a difference everywhere we go. All right, anybody got anything they want to question about this? Did I say something wrong? No, in, in the era of Haggis? Yeah. Mars Hill, that's right. That's right, Mars Hill. I forgot about that. There's some little Christian colleges here and there named Mars Hill and some churches. Yeah, there's a Mars Hill over in Decatur County. Uh-huh, Mars Hill. Anybody else? Well, yeah, yeah, that's right, you know, as Jamie said, you know, like uh, 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 Paul talks, was it Romans or 1 Corinthians, Romans, he says, uh, thinking themselves wise, they became fools. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he could have been because he was there. He remembers it, and you know, most of those, most of those, uh, uh, those Greek philosophers and all, you know, they they might have been wrong, but I don't doubt their intelligence. You know, they they were looking at things and they were coming up with all these uh, ideas about things. And they get with they they went with what knowledge they had, and they're probably geniuses. But you know what? There's there's geniuses, and then there's uh, people that just come on in there, and they're just grifters, you know. And I think a lot of these people hanging out up here on this mountain were just childlike faith. Yeah, 
I think they were, I think they were just a lot of them. They were probably rich and didn't have anything to do. They probably had slaves doing all their menial duties to them, or either they just, they just it was like it said. I mean, and I think it, it was Luke that said this, but I think he had it nailed. And I think he was very skeptical of them. He said, "Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there." Because there are people from all over the known world that wanted to come there. They wanted to come there. Uh, and all who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. You know, they just, uh, they enjoyed talking. They enjoyed talking and, and they doing all this and that. But, uh. Paul demanded them to think beyond all that stuff. And some of them joined with them. And if they joined with them, they soon found out that the kingdom of God is not about just talk. I mean, it's, it's a good thing. You know, when you're hearing from the Word of God and, and you're discussing the Word of God and, and trying to live the Word of God, it's, it's, uh, it's not talk, it's action. And Paul told, told the same thing later on. We can talk till we're blue in the face, but it's got to result in action or, or it's nothing. It's nothing. You know, you can talk to people. Uh, if you see people and see them in need and, and you want to uh, share with them and talk to the gospel about them, talk to them about how, oh, I almost did this and I almost did that. But if you didn't do it, I mean, you ain't done nothing. God wants action out of his people in the uh, I'll be honest with you, uh, I know a lot of people really sometimes vehemently dislike social media, and that's fine, that's their business, but I like to go on there. I'm even on on them sites that not many people are on, like Twitter, and I'll tell you why. There's a lot of good people on there. Yes. It all depends on who you decide to follow. Yes. Uh, I think Twitter is pretty much a, a leftist cesspool but at the same token you've got a lot of godly people on there very educated people godly people and you can go on there and and you can listen to or or or, or watch their posts and how they're talking about you know jesus and and uh, even some some professors are on there you can pick up a lot of stuff from these guys you know what and you don't also always have to agree with them on everything because i don't but you still, you know, you can ask a question, and they'll respond to you. And sometimes people will respond to you not in a very nice way, but, but uh, you know, they're not going to come through the computer and get you. So, you know, it's so all But I pick up a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. And uh, some of it's good stuff, some of it's bad stuff. So it helps you kind of keep on top of what's going on. But some of those guys from the seminaries and theology schools and all that, they, they kind of remind me of the people on Mars Hill. Because, you know, they're always wanting to talk about the new thing. And and uh, these are educated people, too. So, you know, I look at them and, and I say, well, i got a high school education. <laughs> And I'm hearing some of these guys talking, and what they're saying, they don't have enough foundation to back it up on. So, there's that. What the Pharisees and the scribes say about Jesus, you know. Oh, say, yeah. He ain't even been to Yeah. Stuff. Yeah. And they get, they get a, one of the things the Pharisees got me with one time is they were arguing about him. And uh, somebody said, well, maybe he's, Maybe he's from the uh, maybe he's the Messiah, and they would say, "You idiot! The Messiah don't come from Nazareth; he comes from Bethlehem." See, they didn't even understand the whole story. Yeah, he was raised in Nazareth, but he was born in Bethlehem. But they didn't see that because their minds were blocked. They they didn't you know they they figured that was a actual reason because he came from Nazareth. What was it? Uh, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? No, of course not to them. Nazareth was a a frontier town, and there weren't many good things going on around Nazareth. 
Anybody else? Y'all, please keep praying for Brenda's brother Randy. He's done had a heart attack now. Uh, brother Tim, I don't know if y'all all saw it or not, but uh, you read what's going on with him. Yep. He's home. Yeah, I know it. And yeah. Tim, he's a busy man. He's got a lot going on. Uh, yeah. Oh, we saw Brian Lee at lunch today, and I, him and Larry Stewart and some other 